clinic and then enters the, the the waiting room where your receptionist greets the patient and the things what is to be done there which is already covered in the session where we discussed about the front of his procedures then once that is ready the patient is ready to be taken to the uh, treatment room where we are going to perform the treatment that is where we are, we are going to discuss today and then after the procedure where the patient is again escorted back and going outside so just imagine this particular scenario and that is how i prepared based on this i have prepared the the, the sequence so don't get me wrong there won't be any too much detail or the minute test aspects won't be discussed but as a i'll just give you a scenario it will be just a virtual tour of a patient coming to your clinic being taken to the operatory and then you are consulting and then you are deciding what treatment is required whether it's a consultation procedure and how we're going to do and then i'm then procedures along with that so just keep that in mind so let me just give a quick rundown about uh, um, can you give me the permission to record uh, pravish uh, I, I i'll do i'm uh, doing that so i think i need to make you host then no 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 okay you can i, I can uh, you, you uh, can you record it now then can you record it i am i'm doing it let's see okay then. okay no problem as long yes, as it's sir. been recorded not okay. okay now now this is the first thing and let me just have a quick rundown to the front office procedures what we had discussed earlier it's always desirable in case if you have a, a clinical waiting area or the entrance to the clinic as they are your the cleaning staff comes a little early and then you know just use the wear the regular uh, proper protocol wearing a utility gloves and a proper mask and a head cap and then clean the area in front of the clinic with one person uh, bleach solution so that would be a good thing so that the entrance itself will be a little bit clean not that it's going to get spoiled or soiled with the patient's footwear but at least right from the beginning itself if you start it will be nice as the day starts then uh, foot uh, uh, what you call a shoe rack is an essential thing what you require just outside your clinic so that the patient when the patient comes they have to remove the footwear make it a point that the patient removes the footwear outside itself and you have to keep a air force size landscape mode maybe a printed uh, sheet making or informing them to wear their footwear outside because some people might not be comfortable but they are comfortable is not our problem now our problem is safety for us and of course for the safety of the patient and the community so a shoe rack is a must with where in which you can ask and you can instruct the patient another one advantage of keeping the shoe rack outside is they won't actually just you know put the chapels here and there so that basically the whatever chapels or the shoes will be kept in the specified area of the shoe rack so once they leave it is easy for your cleaning staff to disinfect that specified area alone and otherwise every place outside the clinic has to be you know like sort of disinfected later that's again advantage of that then as the patient enters the clinic just imagine i told you earlier it's a virtual tour as the patient is entering the assistant is opening the door and then as the patient is entering here at the entrance itself i would recommend a regular cotton footwear foot mat of a mat okay which can be dipped or you know squeezed in one person your sodium hypochlorite or the bleach solution so this particular mat will be won't be drenched with the sodium hypochlorite but it will be actually uh, a moist amount of uh, sodium hypochlorite solution it will be dripped on so the patient is going to step on this and then moving into your clinic so your footwear foot of the patient will be coming in contact with the one person sodium hypochlorite solution so at the prominent where the patient enters itself you'll be having a clean foot or a little bit uh, uh, disinfected foot and then it will be advisable if you can put another one clean mat here because as the patient's leg might get wet there's possibility that you know the soil the footprints or the imprints could be uh, handling or could be messing up your clinic so it is advisable if you can put another one uh, a floor mat there so that this is actually dipped in one person sodium hypochlorite and then the patient steps on the clean mat and then enters the clinic and then of course your cleaning should be the seating or the arrangements See, don't worry about uh, you might have lost my vision because my ears current is gone but i hope you can hear me pravish can you hear me hello pravish can you hear me i am i am here now mahendra here sir i have taken up uh, your okay, no, slides no. visible sir you can calculate okay, sir no issues because thank you sir. So don't try to, don't try to search or hunt for me i am somewhere here because i uh, now light is come okay because now i'm in a apartment so the generator comes on and off and so i myself i'm finding it difficult so i uh, just interrupt in in between or just call me on my phone uh, mahendra in between issues okay so no issues sir you can continue sir slide is visible you are audible you can proceed okay. sir no issue and and, and i hope the recording is continuing yeah it's continuing yeah so this is i'm talking about the 
yeah so that the clinic the entry area and the, once you enter inside the seating should be arranged in such a way that to maintain the social distancing that we were all talking about all this time every time there should not be any sort of cluttering any sort of mess inside your clinic there should not be a single teapot there should not be any additional furniture there should not be any periodicals there should not be anything in the clinic for which the patient to pass the time so make sure the main advantage is to restrict the patient to come and sit in place where they have to sit finish the procedure and go back let us not create in situations where the, your reception room happens to be an entertainment or an amusement park and make the patient sit for a longer period of time so just simple you know operation in the procedures simple uh, seating arrangements uh, social distancing no any cluttering no any additional furniture no periodicals no journals not even drinking water your has to be kept the disposable of the, the disposable or the, the what do you call the dispenser and should not be kept there should not be in, you can place a tv and uh, the channels can keep on moving but remote should not be given to the patient that has to be kept by your assistant and of course your assistant should be well prepared and they should be actually they are the ones who is actually treating the patient the, the seriousness and the the thing what you have to depict there has to be through your the first person who comes across I mean, the so front of his staff the assistant should be prepared with a head cap a face mask a regular three ply uh, surgical face mask then uh, a 25 uh, gs or 25 rupee or 20 rupee wala plastic uh, pvc uh, apron is good enough and of course a glove so these are the basic things that is required for uh, your uh, your operating front office operating staff I'm getting some disturbances in the okay. Okay, and then then once that the first thing as the patient enters inside, the temperature has to be checked with a non-contact thermometer, preferably an infrared thermometer, because these are all protocols. The pros and cons I'll be discussing later. And after that, immediately as the patient inserts inside, your staff or the waiting room staff or the receptionist can dispense about you know four ml or five ml of your betadine gargle. Okay, we can dilute with equal amount of water and just give in a disposable glass so that the patient either if you have a an arrangement of a wash basin in the waiting room that should be the place where the patient goes and do the gargle or if there's no arrangement of wash basin in your inside your waiting room if there is an arrangement outside the waiting room then you can not this is your staff is actually handing over a disposable glass with about uh, this vitamin uh, gargle dispense and the patient goes outside and gargle and gum once that is done once the throat part is done then second is basically your second patient is you know the sanitizer that again do not let the patient touch on the sanitizer because they always touch and press on the the handles of making it again uh, contaminates it's always advisable though uh, those things to be used only by the reception so that the receptionist dispense about 5 ml of the sanitizer to the patient and because patients are already instructed to wear the mask and come that's the advantage of taking appointment schedule earlier so patients instructed to take the mask and come so with the mask come inside and then the foot is again uh, on the one person beta in your high sodium perchlorate and the seating is done then mouth goggle is done then hand is sanitized and then this is something which i would recommend if it's possible if it's possible because this is something what we use in the bakery or that uh, you know catering industry this is a cheap uh, 2 rupee or 1.5 rupee worth wala at caps okay this again a simple loose fitting gloves made of plastic or polyvinyl or pvc that's again available in the rate of 1.5 to 2 this is something what you can get from those plastic people or those regular uh, disposable items uh, selling wala people okay if you have this advantages once you finish this procedure then if the patient is allowed to wear that head cap and the uh, uh, and the glove then definitely whatever possible areas the patient can further touch is actually prevented or basically taken care by wearing this barrier so if it is possible to adopt in your clinic it can be adopted these are all suggestions depending upon your uh, depending upon your uh, availability and the practicality you can change according to your wish and the same now the patient is again i told you after the procedure and this in this case i didn't have the gloves so my is not ready so it's a desirable thing if you can have so the patient is seated you can see the arrangements on either side uh, somebody somebody's audio is disturbing can you mute this please no yes, sir yes, sir yeah. and then and then of course then after the patient is seated and the, and the glove and the head cap is done and given <laughs> yeah okay now once that procedure is over then it's time for you to collect the data of the patient 
that the regular cardboard writing pad with your clinic would be having a, a database sheet and as a pen can be handed over to the patient so patient writes the details because from that particular point onwards patient is wearing a disposable gloves the cheap gloves what you have given the patient is only covering the face with the mask patient's head is already having that same disposable cheap wala material uh, head cap patient's mouth gargling is already done so your patient's foot is already rubbed on the 1% beta your uh, sodium hypochlorite solution as the patient enters so basically the early cleaning part is done early disinfection part is done early cleaning by your uh, infrared thermometer and the uh, thing is done database patient is going to enter and basically it's a good thing to have this uh, risk assessment form where in which you take a history about all the the current travel details any contact with any covid carriers and the risk potential and all those things are mentioned in the risk assessment form so all these the patient fills and then i what i do in my clinic i have a hard box in a card box okay the size of which is something which is the 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 regular that i when i ordered this uh, gown for me i got a regular uh, body called the cardboard box so what i do is you know it's it's with the lid so i just put one or two tablets of para formaldehyde you get it actually available in the market it's very cheap and it's less than it's available in all the surgical shops so just ask for para formaldehyde tablets this is the same tablet what they use in vapor clave or a formalin chamber this is a para formaldehyde tablet so i put in this tablet this cardboard box one or two is left on the bottom and then the box is actually kept closed so the patient himself or herself after filling the details put the details put the data or the form in the cardboard box so i am trying to prevent as much as possible the unnecessary contact or touch with the patient by anywhere anywhere so that's these are measures what i do in my clinic and again this is another one small plastic box in which i have placed two tablets of formaldehyde or the para formaldehyde this is what i do at the end of the treatment when the patient has to pay any pay paisa or anything of cash patient opens this thing and just put the payment in hand so basically again that we don't have any direct contact because whatever aseptic procedures you have taken so far at the end of the procedure if the patient is giving you some note or cash and you take it with your bare hands then the protocol and everything whatever you have taken is gone because the notes would have been soiled from across the place anywhere in the market we don't know what all where all so it's always advisable if at all the patient is making a cash payment a small container with a small lid and inside that a para formaldehyde tablet can be this a para formaldehyde tablet whatever stuff about it's a can basically it didn't come to be very cheap so so far the front office part is all over you have collected the sheds cleaning is over the initial part is over okay that is collected and then then it's now it's, it's now moving on to the uh, clinic operatory now this is just a quick rundown about the front office part which we had dealt in detail earlier now the patient is ready now after database setting is now your assistant the front office staff opens the door to the entry to the clinic so that the patient doesn't touch anywhere here and there now the patient is going in now from here on work just your as I, i request all of you to be in that state of visualizing that your front office part is over and your front office staff has opened the door and kept and now the patient is going to go inside just imagine that from that particular point of view okay now few things about the ventilation aspect of the clinic organ arrangement the clinic should be very well ventilated now i can't ask you all to just go back and break down all the walls of the clinic but i'm just telling you ideal scenarios so as much as possible whatever is possible try to incorporate in your practice whatever suggestions what i'm placing in this are all economical and not at all going to just you know eat a lot of money from your pockets so these are things what you can keep in mind so it should be properly ventilated when i talk about ventilated it could be either in the form of you know open windows or it can be in the form of uh, exos fan and uh, ac if you are using again i'll tell you about that how to use it again we have already discussed the other day a detailed webinar about ac usage but make sure it's cleaned and well ventilated then our main aim everywhere is to minimize the contact area or the contact patient or the paper level those patient is what we are suspecting the carrier or who can give us or who can gift us with the dreadful corona virus so we should all take all necessary measures to reduce the various modes of spread and the contact areas of spread that is why we have already blocked the hands with that disposable gloves i'm not talking about the regular latex gloves i think that's going to be costly i'm talking about the disposable plastic gloves if we can then the cap and of course patient is wearing mask so patient is still wearing the mask wearing that thin sort of a bikri wala hand gloves and that uh, head cap and enter the your waiting room okay that's what i'm talking about for mask is what i'm talking about patient still wearing the mask what is the next step you should not permit any bystander inside the operatory or the clinic waiting room because as it is is required for you to maintain social distancing to prevent or avoid any flocking inside the 
inside your waiting room it's always better to do that so uh, a clean waiting room without any crowding actually gives the confidence for the other patient also when they come feel everyone fear of going into crowded places so they're not actually entertained and they won't actually appreciate if your clinic is flooded or fogged with so basically it's advisable to retain the gap and the distance and to space up and security so no bystander inside is permitted as per uh, that also you can talk about your instruction and then again another one thing is the the it's a good step it be okay so somewhere where you feel there is a need for an essential requirement of the bystander inside then that's only special situation where you should let a bystander inside once a patient inside is coming the first what i would suggest you to do is to mount is my suggestion because you might you not know, have a facility to give mounts in the waiting room because you might not have a waiting room but you might not have a facility upstairs your waiting room for the patient to watch or uh, rinse the mouth it is always advisable why earlier i told you is if the patient actually is not in the waiting room or outside now there would be a good time for the mouth for the mouth rinse to get the contact with the microbes and to get the effect done rather than just putting on the chair and just being a split of a second watch that's not uh, going to work and there's be a little controversy about the mouth rinse use also let me just make it clear at this particular point uh, coronavirus or the present virus and the infection is always are considered and connected to be a, a respiratory tract infection so there has been people who's been asking what is the use of mouth rinse what, uh, what action does it have it is purely a respiratory infection is coming through the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx and going down to the trachea and that's so so what is the purpose or what is the use and uh, they do not find any logic in that now let me tell you the reason why because of late the yeah. studies have shown that there is an excellent high risk of flora microbial count in saliva also and the reason being uh, all this coronavirus actually has got a very much affinity towards this ace2 the angiospermins and ace2 in this abundant inly available in your respiratory tract in your GA tract as well as the salivary duct tract. now all these actually the reason why there is an abundance uh, location of the microbes in the plate also so that helps us to reduce the microbial count drastically at that particular point of time now it's not going to reduce keeping on because because you know saliva keeps on coming the new and new microbes are going to put that is all true but then some even so there is a modulo disturbance okay is high as low or too slow or what is it uh, no sir it is breaking and few people are commenting there is no audio uh, they are not able to receive the audio problem, I think, sir. Yeah, there is some... it's a network. It's a network. Oh, still there is some problem, sir. Even I cannot hear it clearly. It's getting disturbed. Your voice is fine, sir. The problem is with the internet, sir. you can i think you should continue sir because the net, net issue is there with everyone but if the donor there don't actually uh, get wound one way then what the point yes sir and see at this step yes so and even the participants many people are getting uh, logged out frequently they keep on uh, uh, logging in again and again this is happening frequently also Um, hopefully now i got the broadband connection i hope i should be fine better sir it's better sir now is it it's become better now yeah it's better sir okay okay let's continue now that that is what something i wanted to clear about uh, the controversy or the the, uh, the the confusion regarding the use of mouth rinse can i continue uh, mahendra am i audible better than the yes yes sir you see you are very much audible sir you can Fine. go on. okay okay now and let us all um, uh, spend a moment of uh, a silence uh, uh, praying for the asianet broadband to continue in the same manner and the same bandwidth <laughs> so that i can t- uh, talk to you till the end of the session well now that's about the wash your uh, mouth rinse i hope that has been clear 
Now, what when I talked about wash basins, now in the your operator or the waiting or your uh, working area, if you have two wash basins, it is always advisable to allocate one uh, wash basin for the patient to do the mouth rinse. Again, mouth rinse is actually disposed in a, your disposable paper cup. As per the volume I told you, a 4 ml can be diluted with equal amounts of water, and that much is enough actually. So, because the, the preparation can be one person or two person, mouth rinse is available, both percentage is available. So, you can dilute to the particular ratio what is required. So, and because the actual requirement of iodine, what is recommended by the CDC is just 0.2%. So only 0.2 percent powder iodine or one percent hydrogen peroxide is actually required for you to give us a mouth rinse. So dilute that particular volume and then give in a disposable glass. Patient is okay just rinsing in the wash basin. The why I advise wash basin is because it's got a broader area and then another patient can nicely bend down and then patiently spit. So rather otherwise, if you ask the patient, uh, if you give the mouth rinse on the dental chair, there is all possibly one. The main thing is to just get up, you know, in that particular position and do aim properly in that six inch diameter and to throw the contents of the oral cavity within the confines of six inch diameter it's a herculean task so basically and it's going to create more amount of splatter and more amount of contaminated areas for your assistant to clean later so at a wash basin at the end where you enter in the clinic if it is there if it's there and well if it's there very good so you, you just allot that for the patient that that circumscribed area is only one of the areas where the your assistant has to uh, decontaminate after the procedure now, in uh, where in clinics where you have more than one chair, it is always advisable to keep one chair specifically for the aerosol generating procedures as emergencies or the other chair if you can keep it always for regular consultations and checking and then giving appointments. So even you talk about the, the, the clinic and if it's a linear, if you talk about a rectangular shaped clinic and if you see a patient entering inside, the farthest more, the, the distal most chair is the one which I would recommend you all to keep for the aerosol generating generating procedures for when i talk about agp what i mean is aerosol rate procedures so if the distal most chair would be advisable to be specifically allotted in case the patient needs or requires a aerosol generating procedure as an emergency treatment so the other one can be or the I mean the proximal what can be kept as a you are for consultations and things the advantage is the, so that if at all any aerosol generating procedures has to be done that distal most area would be the maximum area where the aerosol is going to spread around and it's going to get settled unless you carry it various mechanisms. I'll tell you that later. So if you can do this type of arrangement, it would be nice so that, you know, fix it. That particular area should be considered as a red zone in your clinical practical area. Not that other zones are not red, but the exclusive red zone would be the areas around that particular aerosol generating procedure allotted uh, dental chairs. Now, once this is done, patients come inside. Okay, the mask is removed. Mouth rinse is done. Then the patient is taken to the dental chair, seated on the dental chair, okay, with the hand gloves on. That is, these are practically if it's possible. If it's not also, no, no problem. Then make sure that there should not be any unwanted units around because like the, the trolleys and the other materials and things like that, which actually is going to, you know, decorate your clinic. You think it's being decorated, but then those are things which is unnecessarily placed now in the current scenario. And those are the areas where could, that could attract the aerosol and will be difficult for you to contaminate, to decontaminate later or disinfect later. So avoid unwanted units or equipment or anything which is in the immediate vicinity of the your dental chair, what you're going to work on with at least 10 feet or 11 feet distance if you keep it apart that would be nice because the distance what the aerosol carry maximum is about six feet within the confines so that's advice advice so avoid using all sort of any unwanted then once this patient is ready on the chair now it's for us to become ready now the, our doctor actually taking all the protocols and the prevention measures okay that's the i'm not going to details of that that's a proper thorough hand washing and then wearing a glove, your uh, glove, sorry, your gown and uh, gloves and all those things. And donning and procedure, everything was described by Dr. Mahendra well in detail in the earlier presentation. So I'm not going into details of that. Okay, so all the precautions. You need not use a sterile set of instruments, sterile, sorry, sterile set of your donning uh, equipment, which includes uh, your glove or your uh, uh, gown and the face mask and things that need not be sterile. It should be a clean one, okay? The procedure can be done with the proper sterile gloves if it's a surgical procedure and the extraction of that. But otherwise, a clean um, overall um, PPE in terms of the various components would be just good enough.
Now you are ready, you have already ready there, patient is already on the chair and then you are sitting there and then your assistant also should not be just, you know, moving around there always. Now avoid unnecessarily people around, or avoid unnecessarily items around. So let them, if very the help is needed, we can call them, let them come. Otherwise, let them not come here and there and touch, let them not be a part of the, uh, you know, communicable contagious or sort of droplet spread while a people. Now, once you've examined the patient, okay, now after that, you're going to examine the patient, okay, examine the way you realize there is a need for a radiograph. It's always better to go for an extra radiograph than to go for an IOPA. Because even though you might be having a setup in your clinic for a regular IOPA, they have been taking a film, keeping in the patient's mouth, saliva coming in contact, not taking this film, getting to the operatory safely without the other person getting contaminated with that, then washing, removing all this and keeping that area with those x-ray, your film cover, everything contaminated in, again in the lab. So basically you are taking this uh, area of infected or contaminated things to inside your lab and putting it everywhere through your assistant. So do not take any procedure wherein which you have to do. Do not um, take an IOP x-ray. See, RBG, for those who have an RBG, I won't say do totally do not take, but if you can take the necessary uh, sleeve precautions, if the entire sleeve and the cable through the length, it can be covered with a disposable sleeve. Well, you can go in for an RVG, but then again, there should not be any uh, puncture or a tear in the sleeve also anyway. So that is one recommendation or you have an advice for an extra oral uh, extra so that the patient can go and uh, get the thing done and come. Now, based on all these things, you have decided the treatment plan. Now, what is the treatment plan that can actually fall into either only two types? It could be an emergency treatment as per the protocol, what is described now, or it could be something which can be postponed and given an appointment. So based on that, you have actually seen it could be an emergency care or an appointment requiring uh, not emergency procedure. Okay. Then now we have decided, okay, that it is requiring an emergency care. You might be requiring a severe toothache is there. Patient is having severe pain, not responded to your medication. Lower third molar, lower second molar, first molar, whatever the tooth is, now patient is very in pain. So you give so you know, there's no other option rather than to open up the pulp chamber and then, you know, either remove the pulp or excavate a pulp. So you can give up. So that is considered to be an aerosol generating procedure. So if that is a procedure, what you're planning, then definitely you have to uh, wear the regular PPEs with the N95 mask and things like that. I'll tell you that the regular contents of the PP and all later. I'm not talking about the coverall gowns, even though coverall gowns is the one which is actually recommended as per the guidelines for all generate aerosol generating procedures. We have discussed, that means I've discussed yesterday uh, in depth about this and we'll come to the practicalities. I will suggest and recommend some uh, other way of uh, getting protected after this uh, presentation, during the presentation as well. Then as we are, we are doing the aerosol generated procedure, I know it's going to be something, it's not an extraction. Now, you know, that's not something what you're going to do. If that is the case, that won't be considered as a true aerosol generated procedure. It can be considered as a non aerosol generating procedure and can be taken up under the emergency category of treatment extraction, basic under protocols of a sterilization disinfection and a sort of keeping distance, everything can be done. Now, if it's an otherwise, then it's always we're doing a root canal or if you're doing a procedure of anything of that sort, it's advisable to do a rubber dam. That advantage of rubber dam, it might not be practically I mean, easier for you at this earlier time because you might not have been used to, but then in this current scenario, there is nothing like rubber dam which can give you so much of protection from the patient's uh, surrounding tissues, from the patient's saliva, which is again a big, big, big uh, threat for the creation of aerosol, which is a big uh, potential threat for uh, the debris of this, all the microbes. So all these can be avoided to a very great, a very large extent if you're using a rubber dam. So I would strongly recommend you all to start using rubber dam, even though it's going to be a little troublesome in the early days, a little bit of learning curve say, but that will make a lot of difference, that will help you a lot. So rubber dam isolation and high vacuum suction wherever possible because the aerosol, whatever is created. Now, when I talk about aerosol procedure and in, in talking about but, you know, opening up the pulp chamber, opening up access cavity for root canal. The amount of time what you take, for example, if you are creating, if you are using an aerotur to drill the access cavity, because the patient, if the patient is coming with a, a carious exposed tooth and severe pain, the 80% of your work is done so nicely and beautifully by the caries, which are eaten up, and you know there's hardly amount of depth of uh, tissue left to reach the pulp chamber. So there would be hardly much amount of uh, tooth cutting or would be required. So maximum five minutes is what is required. If at all, if at all you are using an aerotur 
फाइव मिनट्स इज मैक्सिमम रिक्वायर्ड सो दैट फाइव मिनट्स के लिए इफ यू कैन डू दिस अबर डैम आइसोलेशन इफ यू कैन डू द हाई वैक्यूम सेक्शन यू कैन रिड्यूस द रिस्क ऑफ कंटेमिनेशन एंड कंटेजियस इन्फेक्शन बाय क्रिएशन ऑफ एयर आल्सो दैट इज व्हाई आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द इमेजिन द यूज ऑफ हाई वैक्यूम सेक्शन इफ इट इज पॉसिबल रबर डैम आइसोलेशन ऑल्सो the use of three way syringe in this current scenario that's a big 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 threat in that i would advise all of you to go back to our old uh, your chip syringe days if you remember that it's nice in a way because let it be i know it's olden days in the bds days is not at all very much encouraging i know those are all haunting memories rather than nostalgic but then i would actually recommend you all to use that the three way syringe or either because advantage there's not too much of air coming in that because again compressed air coming through the three way syringe you know the air, whatever precaution you have taken And a moment of you know like like sort negligence is good enough to create a lot of splatter and and uh, things what you have taken is gone into the air isn't it so as much as possible try because what what do we need because you're not going to actually you don't need that sort of a perfect isolation or dry wall area where you are going for a, a way, you know composite veneer preparation or anything of that sort so what you need is you know, after the cutting maybe just you can just irrigate a little bit then you can use your you know regular cotton you can take small small take me convert the small small balls or you can actually take a tissue paper a uh, small round balls okay you can use a tweezer and just in between mop and take because you don't have so many patients waiting where the time what you spend in uh, you know drying the cavity with little bit of patience is not going to count at all because if you do this advantage you can get uh, you know it might be a middle moist but it's not going to get flooded with any saliva or water so you can neither you can dab with your your tissue paper disposable tissue paper or with your uh, your regular cotton small piece with a tweezer just dip it in and just keep the cavity dry that would be the best option to uh, get and dry cavity because you're not going to i told you you're not going to do ideal treatment at this particular point of time where an emergency is required so those are things um, a little more to continue now and then and if if the treatment was supposed to be a non aerosol generating procedure suppose if it was an extraction things becomes much more easier things become less uh, troublesome less dangerous uh, then the, the routine procedures after the regular wear and things so the, the, then you are coming in contact with the uh, uh, blood and things so the, the 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 your gloves what you were wearing has to be converted to your uh, um, and sterile surgical gloves so wherever possible always wear Uh, if you are using uh, you know for root canal treatment or regular ex uh, your examination and things like that the regular examination gloves i would advise you to wear two gloves i'll tell you the reason why when it comes to removing your gown something that so i would advise you to wear two what pairs of Uh, your regular examination gloves one over the other either nitrate or uh, latex gloves or whatever is comfortable for you should be a clean one and before you wearing also just sanitize with the soap that's more than enough because that will actually remove or relieve the the sting of the latex once you put in the patient's mouth and the sanitation effect will be definitely there on the soap so that is in both ways it's good it's not going to sterilize but it's going to sanitize your gloves so two gloves okay you have already worn inside but if the procedure after cancel if you realize that's going to be an extraction and if you realize that's going be contact the blood definitely the gloves has be converted to a surgical sterile gloves and after the extraction if the patient uh, agrees you know it's so advisable if we can place absorbable sutures but the cost factor is definitely there because absorbable suture is costly but the advantage is you can actually convince the patient that you need not come again that can be retained in your mouth so in case but the patient can't afford to the regular sutures apply no problem but then the patient has to come again so its choice is because if some people might prefer not to come to a again maybe because of the crowd what is the outside or maybe because of the fear so definitely in such people we should it's advisable for you to have a few sets of absorbable sutures so some people by who are actually reluctant for that can actually take up this absorbable sutures then once that you have finished the procedure whether whether it's a access cavity opening done or whatever the procedure is done or whether the extraction is done after the consultation the procedure is over okay then if you are extracting place the pack and all that then again you ask the patient to wear the mask what the patient is worn and what inside so and then this and other immediately after that then you can give the next appointment if at all is required can be scheduled an appointment your staff on the other side will check the appointment you can either tell the patient that will call you and give you an appointment regarding this later or then and there itself your assistant who is standing far that side with your appointment book can check the dates and tell you and these things should be done on the dental chair why i am telling you dental chair is the patient as you remember has come from the op your waiting room straight into the operate working area patient has not touched anywhere patient is wearing that cheap uh, pvc gloves the only thing what the patient has done is has access to your wash basin for the mouth rinse then again the patient has come back to the dental chair with all the possible precautions and procedures you have done the procedure now the 
regarding what is to be done. If it's a consultation, you can give appointment or it's a procedure also, you can schedule the appointment and as per the patient's request based on the time what the assistant is again standing far from that side and telling you the date. Whatever instructions regarding the treatment, what you have done should be done or should be given at that particular point of time with the patient on the chair. I told you earlier, our main intention should be not to let the patient move around, walk around here, touch all those patients, all those possible spots here and there. Let the patient not bless us with lots of touchings and contacts of coronavirus here and there. So basically what we expect is just straight away go, finish the work, come back and go out. That's what really our planning is. So even the post extraction or the post treatment instructions has to be given on the general chair with the patient with the mask on because patient will be having so many doubts. So that time with the mask is safe because there will be no accident the splatter because you might have given a local anesthetic injection for the root canal or extraction. Patient may not be able to hold the lip seal and try to ask you some doubts. So it is always advisable and it's a mandatory thing to make the patient wear the mask immediately after the procedure and patient let the patient ask any doubts to your instructions. Another one uh, important thing which I would suggest to you is now this, it's always advisable for you to have this instructions in the printed format in the soft copy. Advantages nowadays, you now when a patient who's undergoing treatment with emergency with a lot of pain, he or she might not be in a proper framework or a mind to listen to what you are telling and then listen, give and grasp and retain everything. So it's always advisable to send a, a printed email soft copy, your clinic name and the post-operative instruction. If you can, if you don't have one, it is simple, just type and make it in a word format, convert into PDF and then PDF, you can take an image of that, keep it in your mobile, just transfer it in your, your patient's uh, WhatsApp. So basically the instructions will be advisable to be transferred even though you have instruction given in detail to the patient, it's always advisable to send a WhatsApp image because the patient bystander also has to know what are the instructions because you haven't let the bystander inside. So it's always advisable that the patient bystander also is aware of things because once the patient goes back, patient may or may not be weak, patient may not be in the census, patient may not be telling what is to be done. So only if the bystander or people at home know what is to be done, they can take care of the post-operative measures. It's always advisable. That's what I meant and talked about digital. Soft copy uh, uh, has to be um, in WhatsApp instruction has to be given. Then once that is done, your procedure is over. Patients come inside, finished all the procedure, mask is worn, you have given the instructions and the patient is escorted back by the assistant towards the outside into the waiting room. And that assistant in the clinic, in the operating room only is opening the door and things. So patient is not going to touch anywhere. Patient is only wearing the glove and things like that. Now it's time for you to remove your glove and the gown and the things like that. I'll tell you the sequence of removing um, later after this slide. So you have removed it nicely. Okay, and then you have taken care of the hygiene. I very much insist upon the hand wash very frequently because as all of you know, as all of us know, it's very much important and as I say more than any other agent, your regular uh, soap is the best agent to kill the virus in very less period of time. So frequent hand wash, actually make it a point and make it a habit after the procedure also. Now, once that is done, prescription can be written and you know the patient is still on the chair. Prescription you can write if you want and then you can actually hand it over to the patient number one or you can give it in the digital format. If you can just have this prescription written on a thing, take a picture of your mobile, in your mobile, send it to the patient WhatsApp. Now, if though you're prescribing drugs, which is available over the counter, uh, even that digital prescription would be good enough for the current situations. Now, there are some drugs which they may ask for a hard copy prescription. In such cases, you can tear off and give your prescription bad again no contact with the patient so far directly other than during the procedure during which you had already taken the regular precautions and things like that now i told you after that the assistant opens the door and then lets the patient outside and once the patient is going outside you can't just let the patient go like that because we have heard on the procedure you need money desperately need of money so basically whatever your professional fees patient has to pay and you should encourage at this scenario about the digital payment now it's not practically possible everywhere in case you perform to digital payment because some people are not at all uh, you know familiar with this digital world so it will be difficult so i'll tell you how to collect cash for some patients also in such situations now otherwise it's always advisable for them to make that uh, your paytm or the gpay or whatever it gpay bopay whatever it is but humko pena the payment will not that so just make sure that is being done there so that's about the digital payment and the swiping cards should be done with caution because swiping machine remains with us but the swiping the card when the patient contacts the cards, you know, the everywhere patient might touch. So you can actually uh, cover up the swiping machine and keep the swiping area alone, uh, you know, uncovered. 
that way also we can do so that the patient swipes and after the procedure you can uh, actually disinfect the the plastic lamination thing which you have kept on top that also can be done but uh, it should be used with caution if you're using swiping cards so it's always advisable to make a digital payment by gp or online payment or anything of that sort there's no harm in doing a swipe but then swiping machine has to be handled as a potential threat so that should be given and uh, after every patient that should be disinfected also the swiping area i don't know whether it's practically possible to swipe and just keep it disinfected but other areas maybe you can cover it up with a plastic sheet and then disinfect after every use but then i prefer to encourage either digital payment or if at all then not there then cash payment would be better then after the payment is done definitely the the the, the gloves and the hand the, your patient that head cap the disposable ones is removed in that uh, biomedical collecting waste that particular one dabba is there what your uh, yellow dustbin can be in that patient can discard that then patient is wearing the mask still and then before the patient leaves also one last round of hand rep and then the patient exit that's how procedure has to be done and then the in the meantime preparation for the next that preparation for the next includes whatever preparatory procedures in the waiting room to receive the next patient and of course definitely yeah and the operatory room the treatment room also your assistant should be doing all the necessary procedures i'll be talking what all in the when you assistant related work is going to come up with and then post operative telephone follow ups i would advise you all to do that you should be having the contact details of the patient what you are treating with now that's mandatory because as far as it goes if that particular person turns out to be positive or if another person who you have attended in your clinic turns out to be positive and that particular then then that that is a source of uh your contact that could be the person who would have actually gifted you the corona in your area or in your clinic then the matter comes to find out other people who could have been the possible contacted person so you need contact numbers you need database to provide it to the authorities otherwise you will be in trouble you will be actually as per the national defense act the national security act at various sections you will be actually penalized also so you are bound to keep records of the patients you are bound to keep identity of the patients you are bound to have all these contacts you are bound to check the temperature all these are things what are actually going to be asked just in case any patient happens to turn out to be positive and they give a history of visit to your clinic and they the health authority is coming to your clinic and then if your system of managing the patients there if it's not found to be right then you are in big 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 soup it's a big trouble now so that's why i'm mentioning and specifying all these basic things it's not at all a cost i mean costly procedure at all just putting things in the right procedure in the right order mind you don't ever feel disappointed or dejected thinking that oh god i can't practice no never never it's not like that you can practice just have to follow certain precautions just have to put into practice certain guidelines just have to guide you and train and teach your assistants and your fellow doctors to make sure that things are done and make sure you monitor each and everything properly so in that way without any major financial liability so without any major financial investment you can resume your practice that's my assurance to you believe me trust me you can what i mentioned about this this post operative telephonic follow up what i meant is a patient who's gone after treatment to back home it will be always advisable if your your, the, your staff who's actually knowing about the post operative instructions and the the do's and don'ts after the procedure so uh, the staff should actually call the patient and ask how is it they do not ever call the immediate next day because the immediate next day after any procedure either it's a root canal treatment or after the extraction definitely the patient is going to scream and shout at you because when very invariably 80% or 70% is going to have little bit of trouble pain and swelling so if the next day immediate if you call how are you are you feeling fine definitely they're going to give you all sort of you know uh, curses and rubbish so do not call on the immediate post operative day if you are uh, having that uh, you know side is sick pressure of getting some bad words definitely you can go ahead but otherwise i want to recommend you all to call at the immediate next day calling on the second post op or the third post op day would be advisable so that you can remind about the medications you can remind and about the need for mouth opening exercises if you have given an inferior alveolar nerve block and extracted and if you have given a inferior alveolar nerve block and then you have done a difficult root canal treatment with the limited mouth opening again post operative trismus is all likely so then after the second post op day when you call up you should ask the patient about the taking the medications about any possibility of acidity whether the patient is taking antacids whether the patient is doing the mouth opening exercises properly whether the patient is doing mouth gargle and what i mean post operative mouth gargle is warm serene gargle that likely elevate 
the discomfort there if there's any pericoronine infection anything of that sort that also should be actually taken care are you taking care so that sort of a feel or a call from the patient or the or the clinic or the doctor will definitely uh, you know make the patient really fall for you both in terms of you know uh, giving that feel and uh, uh, showing of a family doctor style that is something what we all should be focusing here upon let us not actually um, i mean run after quantity practice let us stick on to quality practice where in which a minimum number of patients are treated with adequate care where that patient you know keeps connected with you always they should actually recommend more and more people to you and then that is the way you build up your family doctor your concerned doctor wala uh, you know attitude and outlook towards dentistry that's going to last rather than the quantity or the uh, amount of volume because nowadays no i'm 100% sure in the in the early era the volume of the patient would have been a factor for other patients to decide whether that doctor is good because the crowd is flocking there chalo let's go there but now it's not going to be like that i'm telling you people are going to select and choose places where they do definite you know small amount of practice where they follow the current mandatory preta protocols they need not actually uh, be aware about the dental protocols but they are all aware about the basic safety measures what is required because it's all in the screen the government has instructed many things so everyone is aware about that so if you are following those uh, simple simple protocols if you are taking adequate care of the patients and their need if you are showing that sign of caring to the patient and giving that or giving a, a feel of security and confidence to the patient then you are done with it and i'm sure the patient is going to stick with you for a long period of time and they're going to speak for you too well our uh, use of as you're doing the procedure and this is what i was talking about the use of rubber dams is very much advisable with the high volume suction so that you know so you can see there is not even a single point where the oral cavity or the saliva is going to come in contact other than this specific area here but even then there's hardly anything if at all during the aorta you happen to create any sort of the air and the water mixture it's not going to get you know mixed with saliva too much hardly anything the role load will be very less in that the viral load will be very less in that so if you have use a high vacuum suction along with that that be very much appreciable that's what i was talking about so use of a high vacuum suction will be advised this is the difference between not using a rubber dam and this is basically a big risk in case all the same aerosol is going to come out okay so I try to use a rubber dam and with a high vacuum suction practice well in some patients you may might be allergic to latex or the rubber dam procedure so in that patient if at all you doing make sure you do proper isolation okay with proper cotton the advantage is when you do a isolation there will be hardly any you can just use a simple cotton just make it in rolls and keep it in the vestibule and definitely that's going to help you definitely and then advantage is when the saliva is not getting collected there there's no fear of unnecessarily splatter of the saliva there also okay this along with your suction and isolation will be an effective tool when patient where your rubber dam is not practically feasible well now with that the surgeon voila related things are all over i told you one procedure i'm not going to details of procedure time now you know once you uh, uh, are done with the procedure let us uh, i would just suggest about the doffing because donning and doffing has been officially and as per protocol in detail taken by dr mahendra peramal during one of our webinar sessions and after that then we thought we discussed and then this is something which i thought is a practical method of uh, doffing let me just it's a, it's my suggestion basically it's not the standard guideline what is being taught the word but then based on the procedure what we do and based on things what we are doing let us see i'm not talking about the cover all the regular procedures uh, this is again uh, a picture in a way you're born uh, what this is my picture mind you it might not look like me even though it's a, a miniature form of me though i like to see this picture always because it looks very you know i have thinned it down so at least in picture let me see that way and uh, this is again uh, I'm, I'm i'm with uh, my head cap okay i have a eye protective wear i have a mask surgical mask for a consultation a face shield i'm wearing a regular regular your uh, gown i'm not wearing coverall regular gown and on top of that i'm using a symbol disposable plastic your apron this is what i use now okay now about to how to you know if, if this is a situation there now how should you proceed with the uh, your doffing okay just simple as that i told you the importance of wearing two masks just keep and remember two examination masks okay has to be one always whenever you are working on patient and surgical mask of course in all patient or procedures where in which you are doing surgical aspect okay now first what i would suggest is once the procedure is over you are contaminated your hand is contaminated you are uh, your, your face shield would have had some sort of a splatter or whatever it is uh, and then that's uh, that's outer glove okay so first we have to remove the outer glove okay this is my suggestion let's listen this is open for discussion later also we can admins can contribute in that i'm just talking about the practical outer glove you remove so you are left with an inner glove then 
first thing what you do is the face you know face you should remember all these front area is our critical zones as far as your contamination is concerned all over the front area right from your head forehead till the waist part everything in the front your hand and arms are all potential critical area you call it as the contaminated area so next what you're doing is the face shield after once you remove the first outer glove then the second one is the clean glove what you have inside okay and face shield has to be removed from behind never touch anything in the front face shield the elastic or whatever way the buckle or whatever is remove it from front and hand it over your assistant who's actually ready with the utility glove to disinfect the face shield okay so we have removed and given the face shield then the next is basically you have removed the eyewear or the protection eyewear you can remove that okay that again should never be touched from the front because if the bottom from the maximum uh, behind it if your goggles is something having a, a tape behind always remove it from the behind tape then of course the mask again should not be touched from the front should be always behind the elastic area has to be the point where you remove the mask head cap has to be again removed from the back should not hold in the front and remove head cap should be removed from the back now regarding uh, the remaining part, what I told you earlier, face shield can be given to the assistant for disinfection. Eyewear again can be given for disinfection. Your N95 mask again, your three-ply mask also I told you, that is not going to be disinfected, but it's going to be stored in a box like I earlier we described. Head cap is again either disposed or keep in a box. Okay, and then gown is again the, the last, the next one. The gown, what I'm talking about is this. You can't touch anywhere in the front. So you have a clean gloves on you. You have removed the upper component of the whatever is this part, you have removed it. Then the, you know, from the behind part, okay, release the knot, okay. Now on the gown, they have released the ones first, you release the knot, and then the, the head part, you remove it, okay. Because if I'm talking about the plastic apron, you're removing the behind part, and then the head part, you have removed it because I'm, and that again, holding the behind area only, you have to get the head part slided out after that what you should do is you fold the gown inside outside okay because the exposed area should actually be bent inside so you remove the gown like this and you just fold inside and then from top to bottom you can just roll like that okay something like your masala dosha remember but masala dosha roll just roll it downwards okay you have still wearing your gloves okay the second gloves is there and then the, that can be immersed in the disinfectant solution it could be a detergent solution with a disinfectant or a regular swap also good enough okay you have disposed you have put in your a detergent solution so that that can be disinfected and used after two three patients right? till then you are using the next set of your new uh, um, dresses and the gown i'll tell you i'll how to use that now once this is all over then your footwear also can be removed your foot gown or your the shoe cover or whatever can be removed then you finally are removing the the last gown last glove okay then properly wash your hands and the arms area whatever area was exposed i'll show you a picture in which basically sometimes there's a possibility your arms are exposed so if your arms are exposed nicely wherever it's exposed nicely rub it with soap wash with soap and use a sanitizer then wash face. After that, wash your face. Once your hands are everything is clean, then wash your face and the T-zone. I'll come to the picture where I show the T-zone later. Properly wash and then dry with the disposable tissue or if you have a hand dryer or a tissue dryer, electric operated. And after that, if you want, you can prescription. If anything patient is waiting there, you can get the prescription. So this is my suggestion in sequence of removing your doffing or the PPP equipments from one from the start to the end. So you can manage. So that's the advantage of wearing a double glove, a double examination glove uh, from the beginning if you're doing a non-surgical procedure. So that first glove is removed, then you have the other clean glove to do all these procedures later. Well, when, 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 when some uh, people uh, Asian now when some people had uh, asked me uh, um, where is there where is there's a small uh, room in a clinic we're just hardly having a, a two chair just a little bit of space uh, I mean, there was recommendation that you know you should be having a separate room for donning and doffing now what can we do like you know like and so then also there's a solution this is basically what i found in the net basically you can have this ready-made you know travel tent you know the, the portable tent is there you can keep anywhere in part of the clinic it's basically a small just accommodate one person sizes there so you can actually enter if, if you are very keen on having a separate area because donning is not at all a problem because you don't need a specific area because donning you are actually wearing something which is just clean right from the head cap to the bottom it's all just clean so there's no question of any sterilization protocol there but only if you're doing a surgical procedure only thing what's in your in your in the, in the pb is your sterilized gloves all the rest are clean gloves for all of your procedures which includes an emergency pulpal chamber opening also you don't use to use a sterilized thing you can have a clean gloves with the entire thing procedures 
So the problem comes when it comes to doffing, when you try to remove it. That's where you have this risk of your entire thing contaminated and that's where you need to have a separate room if possible, if possible. Okay, if you can incorporate this small ready-made tents, that is also possible. Again, not a mandatory thing. Otherwise, wherever you're staying, go to the most the, the, go to the red zone, remain in the red zone itself. I told you in the clinic, the area where you are allotted for the aerosol generating procedures is your risk zone, is your 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 red zone. After the procedure, if you are doing the doffing, if you don't have a facility for this tent, if you don't have a facility for an extra room, you stand there only and doff it properly so that that area which is going to be disinfected later is where you are removing the uh, PPE gowns. Okay, so that that will be disinfected later. Do not come to the cleaner area of the clinic or to the area which was not uh, which was kept as a separate uh, zone. Do not come to that uh, green area. Remain there. Remove the gown and then only come into the other part of the clinic. I'll talk about that. Later. What are the procedures to be followed by assistant okay first thing is what you should realize is now you should actually avail the service of your assistant or leave that particular person healthy as you know any person who's having an uncontrolled diabetes any person any any of your staff who's actually having any medically compromised conditions if the staff is health unhealthy in terms of if the staff is pregnant old age all these are conditions which is actually making them more prone and more vulnerable to this infection so make sure your staff is healthy because after getting an unhealthy staff you will be both ways whether you'll be scared of corona and you'll be scared of this staff also getting a corona so basically think about then kuch corona okay so that's basically about the utility of the staff availing and of course hand hygiene has to be very much instructed the importance of hand hygiene has to be instructed frequent hand hygiene has to be monitored no harm in just shouting at them and make them understand and the importance of the frequent hand hygiene and the t zone and areas so they let them become more aware let them be a little bit scared about this let them know about the value of being remaining alive let them remain you know be more comfortable by being so secure so let them practice so hand hygiene you have to enforce depends upon how you are doing in this if you just say and if you're not doing it frequently then they won't follow you being the person who's instructing should be the first one as a role model to make them understand the importance and you should be doing it properly regularly and frequently too you should always insist upon them changing into clinic wear. I would recommend your clinical staff or the faculty, including you, to have two set of dresses in the clinic to be worn only inside the clinic. So once you come from your staff, might be coming to your clinic either in the form of own transport or might be public transport. We don't know where all they have gone through and coming to your clinic. And if you are entering them, letting them inside without changing their clothes and things like that, you couldn't have potential people among you. Sir. So when the staff comes, make sure that after doing a proper hand hygiene and things like that, let her or him change her dress to the clinic set. She or she, he should be having two set of clinic wear. So suppose one set, that particular, uh, your staff is changing into that set. And then the, on the both what he or she has come, just put in a rubber, your paper bag and just keep it around, wind it around and keep it there. Okay, you can maybe you can just put some disinfectant spray and dry up, wind it up and just keep it there. So the patient, the, the staff is worn in the clinic attire. And then the regular other procedures has to be taken care. Mask is a continuous wear for the staff. Why I'm telling you these things, I'll tell you. Mask, then head cap and face shield. Why I told you this is not a mandatory, but face shield can, you can get a face shield for under the rate of 60 rupees. And suppose if the staff happens to be a person who's going to assist you for the procedure, he or she will definitely really need a face shield. So a yeah, face shield, if it's actually bought for a staff, then why not let her use it at the time also so that any accidental cough or anything of that actually can shield her. So why I'm telling these three things is, now if they get used to the habit of wearing a mask always, the T zone is covered, head cap always, the tendency to pamper and you know count the number of hair about the loss yesterday and the remaining today, that sort of habits will be gone, messing around and fiddling with the hair, and face shield, that accidental coming to that source is gone. And of course, gloves, definitely, I mentioned that, uh, I mentioned an examination, that should have been included, uh, examination gloves should be also a mandatory requirement always, because now without a uh, you know, regular uh, non glove touch, you won't get that pleasure of touching here and there and you know also in one way. so you're trying to wean that habit so regular examination glove from the morning to evening same glove they can wear they can just sanitize in between that's all so glove and mask and uh, head cap 
and uh, glove and mask advantages definitely the tendency to touch areas where there's a possible chance of spread of infection is totally avoided then a plastic gown i showed you i'll tell you later a simple plastic gown with a sleeveless gown is good enough for them to make sure that their front area is covered and protected then examination gloves i told you always they have to wear utility gloves they have to wear whenever they are doing the disinfection process of the chair they are whenever they are transporting the instruments from the soil zone or the danger zone to the sterilization area whenever they are disinfecting the chair and the premises of the floor always they have to wear utility gloves otherwise examination gloves is good enough for them to be worn if assisting your case definitely all that tear the precaution what you are taking has to be incorporated for the staff also and once the procedure is done the patient has to be taken care and the support has to be taken and when i talk about support what i'm not talking about you know lifting the patient from there and then until uh, then you have made a non non contact and then suddenly being over supportive and then going and lifting the patient and when being so empathetic not that so whatever requirement as for the instructions okay now get up now procedure so okay on this side yes and escorting attitude simple courtesy simple acts of gesture of kindness and empathy that is all what is required from your side because no point in smiling too much with your mask on because i tell you patients are not going to see that so most of the part when your expressions are mostly hidden but at least by gesture okay you should show that act of you know sort of concern and sincere and uh, uh, you know um, support for them instrument transport after the procedure the person has to take it with care wherein that utility gloves i told you to that particular i'll be discussing about the things later what happens to the transport instruments cleaning disinfection and all that then it's time for the disinfecting the chair and the chair and the neighboring areas okay for that patient is it's kept ready for your next patient floor disinfection has to be done after the disinfection of the chair areas and things like that yes, and please if i use if i use the hand piece definitely it has to be taken definitely cleaned and then taken for autoclaving so it's always advisable to have three or four hand pieces don't don't even dream to run a clinic with just one hand piece which is to be used for all the patient i sincerely request and urge you all to buy at least four hand pieces you be having four functioning hand pieces every day autoclaving when you do you can actually i'll show you in my next step where i talk about autoclaving you can have you know you can pouch the article of the autoclave hand piece and keep depending upon the use just opening it up now so otherwise it will remain sterile also so after using autoclave with your glove your hand is in one person patient never use that again your surface disinfection with the alcohol spray whatever it is is not going to give you protection because the entire turbines and the your bearings inside then that thing is already lodged with plenty of microbes so don't ever use any hand piece without autoclaving then floor disinfection sorry that came repetition then standard sterilization protocols has to be adopted like when the patient when the instruments is taken that said before the next procedure and once the the then their days procedure is over the staff has to change the dress or the clinic dress what he or she has worn and get into her dress what she had actually and what is the fate of the dress what she has used today in the clinic that is to be you know again put in a bucket of detergent solution or with the disinfection there are solutions available with the squad disinfectant properly also wash it just you know clean it drip it put it in a hanger and hang it and then let her leave with the clothes what she came wearing in and for that and for the next day when she comes her she is going to change the dress what she's worn and come and again she's going to change into the second set of clinic dress what she's having okay not the one what she just washed the day before so in the second set so that day evening same way she'll be washing the second set and putting into drying and going the third day when she comes the first set will be nice and clean and ready so that way two sets of your uh, attire in the uh, clinic is a must and that's again a better way in a good way to give them a lot of uh, confidence also to enforce that uh, you know pakka protocol these are all things which is not even going to cost you an extra penny the same thing is advisable for you doctors also it's always advisable to have a sorry <coughs> excuse me i was audible enough well very well audible you know sir i can see some faces suddenly trying to cover up their face thinking he seeing my coughing so the 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 the, the, the fear of the, <laughs> the corona is so bad that the moment they you are hear some cough or sneeze anywhere wherever you are maybe watching movie also you tend to automatically you know cover up the t zone so much is the influence of it okay so once dr okay. ipen dr ipen anand here anand i can hear dr. you 
Yeah, sir. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as you said, uh, uh, what about the patient's uh, uh, drape? Yeah, that's one uh, thing. If it is a aerosol yeah. procedure. Yeah, true. Now that is a good part, question. I would like side. to explain. Yeah, because yeah, Second because I was. Is, I was planning to take up all this towards the end of the session, so that let me present my presentation. Now, but since you have asked okay. me here, I'll take up this part. Now, whether you need a drape for the patient or not. Now, you have taken all the early screening measures. Now, you should actually suspect every patient who's coming to your clinic as a potential COVID carrier in the current scenario, because we don't have any official or resources to actually make out unless we do all the tests and come, which is going, not going to be practical to tell all your patients to do the tests and come. So patient, every patient whom comes to your clinic, you has to be taken the necessary precautions. So initial precautions, what you have taken is all your screening measures, disinfection, your hand, if you have even that glove, head area, mask area. Now the patient is coming there on the chair. On the chair, again, the patient's mouth is open. Okay, then the, the potential risk there is the possibility of you and your staff getting contaminated with the, um, you know, aerosol or anything from the patient. If the patient is already a carrier, there is no risk of patient getting contaminated with the patient's own saliva or the aerosol what is created. So a symbol, if you want a symbol, uh, regular uh, the disposable that 10 rupees while a gown is good enough if you want uh, to put for the patient because you don't have to spend for a costly coverage area for the patient because you have taken all the necessary precautions so that the patient doesn't get anything from you. The second risk is from the patient. So if the patient is already a carrier, there is no point in protecting the patient anymore further. Then the protection comes in between the for the procedures, what you take care after the procedure so that this particular carrier patient should not, should not have left behind anything for the next person who's an innocent to get infected. So that is where, that's why I didn't actually give much importance for the patient raping or anything of that protocols, what is to be required. So that doesn't make any much of it. There's no harm in uh, using a drape for the patient. But then the problem is, again, after using that for the patient, you can disinfect. If it's a disposable plastic, what I think what you said, you can buy one for 20 rupees or 25 rupees. You can wear for the patient. And then after that, like how you have disinfected your thing in a disinfect solution, you can leave it there. You can buy 10 or 15 of those 20 rupees wala, uh, plastic wala apron. This is, it can be very much handy for the patient also. So there's no harm in using for the patient. Why I didn't insist on that is because the, there's no point in again protecting the patient who's already a carrier. Now other things like for the other patient who's an innocent person who's come inside for not getting contaminated by the previous positive patient, you are doing all the chair set procedures, you're doing all the procedures around, you're disinfecting, you're taking care of anything, everything like that. So this draping of one patient is not going to actually prevent the other person getting contaminated with the remnants of this. So that is why I didn't insist upon but, that. But yeah, it's a good thing. To, yeah, after, uh, after the aerosol procedure, if the patient is walking back to the front office and uh, uh, occupying the seat over there, or interacting with the office, office people over there. I think having a drape and disposing is always a better option. Uh, no harm. We can restrict. See, yeah. One thing what you should understand is, now a person actually, if the patient is already a carrier, if the patient is already a carrier, he or she would have already contaminated the surface by the time she came. Because even though we have taken to put the mask, if you have put the head cap, the interaction with the office bearers of the official people there would have happened in the clinic in earlier itself. So that case, there's nothing new by with an aerosol. So aerosol will definitely make the patient's dress less sweat if you wear this. But then after wearing this also, if at all there was an, any aerosol on the dress or the fabric, that is not just going to jump and, you know, just connect it with everyone. Because the root of entry of the virus is not from the dress materials. Everything happens only when the touch here and then and touch in the T-zone. So as long as there is no any direct, but even if it's on there on the patient's dress also, it is not going to get infected unless the patient touches your dress and touches somebody else in the day area where the T-zone is coming. So there's no harm in, uh, like Dr. Anand said, putting the air, your gown or your uh, uh, disposable drape just to make the patient feel a little bit more secure. But then practically and logically, that doesn't make much of any added uh, uh, safety either to the patient or to the operators because you don't like, that's why I said, 
you are should be only working on appointment basis there should not be any flocking of people as soon as the patient comes your intention is to take the patient side do the work take the cash and send the patient back so that interaction and other intermingling we are not going to keep that area for any sort of mingling and things like that whatever said they would be talking to one or two but then entry of the waiting room should be absolute control of your waiting staff or for front office staff not more than the available uh, space for the social distancing should not be allowed so that's why i said appointment practice is a must the more you make the people wait in the waiting room would be nice and satisfying for you to see oh so many are waiting but remember about the more time you are making the patients wait in the waiting room even though the mask is on again the potential of the viral load going there is more if they are carriers so as much as possible try to retain only one patient at by stand or at the most two in your waiting room at a time so that that's why i said the system of appointment has to be incorporated in the current scenario so that that it will take a little long time for them to get used to that system but appointment system is a must so that the flocking is less and the risk like what anand said if you go back to the room and then discuss that all everything can be avoided so a uh, patient sir, rate will be nice if we can put uh, please uh, suppose if now we know that in kerala the covid has come from february onwards and now this is almost me now if a patient is saying i was treated uh, 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 for being positive and uh, now it is almost one and a half months or two months it's over or if a patient is saying i was under isolation and i was negative so no what are the special things one should take care of if such a patient walks into your clinic I'll, i'll answer this question also now and the remaining we'll take up after the end of the presentation okay anand so that is we won't finish it other things okay i'll answer this now and the remaining queries just remember to ask there's so many in the chat box so we'll take it with now a person who's treated now as per the studies or as per the experts who are in this field any person who's been treated and recovered should actually be taken as a covid negative but all necessary precautions for a positive covid carrier should be given okay so other than that because see any uh, unknown person who is an asymptomatic carrier is the same like a, a patient who is treated but a person who is treated actually is actually giving signs and symptoms of a lack of covid their test will be negative so in such patient the risk is less rather than the present situation where you have unidentified persons they would be all asymptomatic carriers so whatever protocol that you have laid down won't change whether that person is a covid positive or treated or untreated or not so if you follow this basic standard precautions that will take care of every patient if it is an asymptomatic carrier and if it is a person who's actually got treated also so that this different doesn't make that's my point to you anna so this not have to make any changes in chain in pertaining to practice protocol because if you are going to take extra precaution for a person who's treated then definitely that means you are not sure about the protocol what you have put in place now that that see you are the most important thing is to put the protocol in patients whom you feel you are not sure that that fear of unknown should be there for you that uncertainty should be there for you you should treat every person who is coming to you as a potential carrier so regular standard precautions and protocols what i said so far will be good enough and will suffice for if the other patient a carrier non carrier anything of that sort okay thank you then the after changing that tire i told you at the patient the by staff your uh, staff has to put the thing in the uh, detergent in a bucket or whatever it is just close it or wash it and keep and just hang it on a hanger in the laboratory area wherever it is and then go so that but that's these are things what is the procedures to be handed over by the assistant now let's have a quick uh, recap of what are the things what i said now i i hope you remember the front office area the screening and everything is done and the patient is ready to be welcomed into the operating room where we are desperately and patiently looking for patients to have some patience and peace of mind out here because not lot work over these days so let's just imagine the situation now patient is ready are you ready fine well the the operator the front office staff opens the door and keep it open so that patient doesn't touch anywhere patient is only going to come inside with the disposable plastic sleeve bag uh, gown uh, sorry um, gloves then the head cap and and uh, definitely mask on coming inside then as the entry of the clinic itself what i this is my way how i do it at the entry itself of of the clinic at the first mat is again another one floor mat dipped with one percent sodium hypochlorite that's not dripping that's not drippingly soft but that is having adequate amounts of hypochlorite on that the barefoot patient of this stepping on that and the second one mat on front of that actually dries off the excess if at all anything so that the patient won't leave any muddy imprints in my clinic so the clinic is entered 
then I told you the clinic, how it should be, it should be properly ventilated. It's ideal to have a proper clinic wherein which you get a lot of windows open. And if, if no windows open, I need to try or plan for a exhaust fan. So ventilated adequately uh, clinic should be there enough. And, and to me, if I say I would actually prefer to use the last chair, this part, I told you the distal most area where I can have ventilation out here. And this area would I be taking up as a, uh, if at all I have to do any aerosol generated procedure, this is the area, the last chair area is where I would be taking it up. And that's so that my area of the red, the real red zone, I can restrict to the distal most area. And this would be uh, the, the pink chair would be one where I do my regular consultations where I have no fear of any aerosol producing procedures. And this is my consulting table, which I don't ever let my patient to sit or stand or move around nowadays after things are over they go straight away as they go inside they come back as they go inside they come back no waiting room here no they don't have to sit and consult they don't sit and talk with me whatever i talk i do on the chair with the patient mask on so that in case if they have any doubt also they're not going to bless me with their saliva so those things i take care of that and then as the patient entered inside, this is one wash basin I told you, I would be having a over an ID in mouthwash, a sanitizer and a tissue box is there for them. So based on that, you can, depending upon your facility, you can arrange that, whatever. But these are the only three things what should be there, a disposable tissue uh, for the patient to mop the mouthwash if they want to just wipe the mouth. And of course, uh, the, the mouth rinse and the hand sanitizer uh, can be made available. And this is the, the, the mouthwash I usually dispense and keep it ready. I won't ask the patient to take it and I just told you the arrangements there in the bottle but I don't let the patient dispose it. I will have my staff actually dispose because we don't have any more than five or six patients in a day if at all in emergency procedures. So I do keep it things ready just for disposable glass take it and keep it and then the thing is ready for the patient to be handed over and then another one what I noticed is uh, most of us wash patients we do have this so called uh, uh, the, the round mirror the face mirror but my request to you is do not keep the mouth your face Face mirror on the, in front of any wash basin. If at all is there, do not keep that because the patient tends to look and you know check the beauty and then you know comb the hair and things. Then the tendencies are more. So just remove the face mirror if it's there about the wash basin for your safety and for that the patient comes back to the business. And then I'm ready. Now the patients come to the chair, I'm ready with my procedures. I've told you the protocol, simple thing based on, I've, yeah, I've just consulted only. I don't know whether I'm going for a aerosol generating emergency or a regular consultation. So my mask is still a three plus surgical mask, okay? And this is my assistant who's already ready with a, a single. Now, if you notice, the assistant has not worn the inside full gown. What she's worn is a regular laboratory, the apron, the plastic symbol apron with a, a symbol gloves. And of course, I told you she or may, may or may not be assisting. So she only has a, a face shield. So that's why I use the face shield, the head cap and the mask. There are advantages and disadvantages. I'll come to that because the amount of exposed area, I'll tell you the advantage and disadvantage of that. Okay, so this is one, the way I call my staff, but I'll tell you how I do it in my clinic. But if you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, definitely you can wear this full sleeve gown with the uh, gown and the procedure, and you can put the thing on top. Otherwise, just a simple uh, plastic gown and the uh, examination gloves is more than enough. And that's how I'm ready for my procedure. What is this? Basically, it's an examination I'm trying to uh, determine. And as you can see, the window behind there. Can you see that? The windows are left open. So I'm not, see, these are all may not be possible everywhere. I'm telling you, may be possible. My situation is possible. So the places where they don't have any adequate facility for window, always make sure that you should insist at least install at least a exhaust fan. And there should be some portal of a fresh air entry. So there's no point in just using an exhaust fan where there is no portal of entry. So one somewhere every year, some particular area, should have some sort of portal of entry and one area there should be portal of access where you don't have a windows facility so there i'm ready with my everything on well when i talked about mouth rinse okay i'm insisting upon betadine bovidonide in mouth rinse or one person hydrogen peroxide mouth rinse okay these are the only two mouth rinses which is actually recommended as effective as the, the thing like that and hexidine mouthwash is not actually recommended because the studies done in Wuhan have shown hexidine to be less effective against the coronavirus. So in the current scenario, as a mouthwash to be effective against coronavirus also, iron will stand the first choice and hydrogen peroxide one person the second choice. That's the things which should be used in that. And I've seen, I've heard people ask me about the use of Dettol, diluted Dettol solution can be used as a mouthwash or not. And then my question, my answer to that question is never ever use Dettol solution as a antiseptic 
liquor because these are all uh, preparation for external use and this consists of a chloroxide in all the ingredient chloroxide is actually a potentially toxic substance do not use that all as a diluted form for a mouthwash or a mouth rinse so betadine or uh, hydrogen peroxide again chloroxide is less indicated because of the lack of efficacy now the procedure is over like i told you now just imagine virtually imagine i have you have seen me the procedure patients over and instructions are given patients going outside i showed you a box earlier a plastic box where in which a formally a tablet is kept and thing the patient is paying me in cash this patient does not have a payment uh, electronic payment is not possible digitization is he has a mobile but a sada mobile no account anything of that sort so whatever charges i say and then the amount is put in that you should be having your own set of change you know 100 200 or whatever money you should be having a few set that should be given to the receptionist depending upon some people have the system of collecting the cash in the operator or the in the waiting room or the reception area where the receptionist collect this not by hand uh, am i audible hello am i audible yes 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 okay. yes so there are you audible audible Okay, so so basically the receptionist doesn't collect it. You have a box there. Now in, this is my reception counter and the table. On one side you can see I have allotted two feet of the reception table there just to keep this money box. One hardboard box I showed you earlier, where in which the patient can drop the cases, case sheet and the file filled one things there. So actually there is no direct contact with those paper things to any of my receptionists and myself also. And the next day that this all is sterile because I have only placed it in a formaldehyde, the para formaldehyde tablets in that, and that is cheap. This plastic dabba doesn't cost you anything. The other one dabba is actually by courtesy to my courier person who actually couriered my gowns. So nothing is expensive in that. Just the part of putting it. If you want to make it look in decorative, then you can. Put it with something and decorate with some, uh, you know, so papers or things. Like Otherwise, no need for that. So the patient actually, I told you earlier, is wearing the mask from the dental chair itself. I told you immediately after the procedure, I insist on the patient wearing the mask. From that particular point, patient is wearing the mask, coming outside. Okay, then paying, making the payment. I give him the balance directly, but then do not touch the patient. Okay, if at all balance required, you can give the cash, and that's the cash there. And then that's how you can see the formal he get tablets. Okay. Okay, don't don't uh, see about the two thousand payment. It's about the two days. Coming now, this is the formal ticket tablet, para formal ticket tablet there, which is kept there. This you can make out after two days, it get disintegrated and powdered like that over a period of time. So uh, that's uh, can be kept and the lid is closed and uh, the notes can be taken the next day. And before the patient leaves after the payment, one set of uh, a disinfectant, the body called the sanitizer, is again given by the staff. And uh, the staff itself open the clinic door so that the patient doesn't touch anywhere on the door and the handle. And the patient leaves comfortably. And at the exit area, you can give a uh, your dustbin area where you can actually. Uh, the patient can discard the gloves and the cap. What the patient is going mouth anyway, the mask anyway, the patient is going to wear because that's mandatory. The other part, patient can discard it outside in that uh, biodegradable, biomedical waste disposal container. So this is how, in brief, a patient has come inside and patient has gone outside. Now, in the current situation, now let me suggest we had actually a big discussion yesterday. Uh, a coverall is what is actually recommended as per the 